Coming up on today's Airborne, Boeing rolls out its first 7879 Dreamliner. The world's oldest balloon race is underway in France, and Copper State's fly-in will be untowered. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The first 7879 Dreamliner rolled out of Boeing's Everett Washington factory and onto the flight line Saturday. Teams are now readying it for flight tests later this summer. The first 7879 Dreamliner became the first 787 to don the new Boeing commercial airplane's livery. At 20 feet longer than the 7878, the 7879 will extend the 787 family in both capacity and range, carrying 40 more passengers an additional 300 nautical miles. With the second and third airplanes in final assembly, Boeing and the 7879 are on track. First delivery to launch customer Air New Zealand is set for mid-2014. One of the world's oldest and most prestigious aviation events got underway this weekend with the launch of the 57th Coupe Aeronautique Gordon Bennett Long Distance Gas Balloon Race in Nancy, France. 18 teams from 10 nations are competing in the event, where the winner is the balloon team that flies the farthest in straight line distance. The launch process was delayed over six hours by passing thunderstorms and did not get underway until 5.45 a.m. local time Sunday morning. But by 7 p.m. local time Sunday evening, a mere 13 hours after launch, seven teams, including both U.S. entries, more than one-third of the field of competitors, had landed, largely because of weather, with balloon teams reporting severe turbulence. The British team of Clive Bailey and Paul Spellward executed a tricky but safe night landing in a forest as severe weather approached. With winds generally flowing to the southeast, flight directors theorize that the eventual winners may fly out over the Atlantic Ocean before steering back to Spain for landing. The FAA had planned to charge organizers for the Copper State fly-in for air traffic control services, but they decided to go with Plan B. Tom Patton explains. Pilots arriving for the Copper State fly-in at the Casa Grande Municipal Airport in Casa Grande, Arizona, have been greeted each year by an enthusiastic crew of FAA air traffic controllers. But this year, things will be different. The event's organizers said in a news release that for the first time in the 40-year history of the event, the FAA informed them they would be required to pay a user fee totaling many thousands of dollars to cover controller salaries, overtime, travel, and other expenses. As if to add insult to injury, the FAA declared the military surplus control tower used for the past 10 years to be unsuitable for controller use. Of course, the cost of the FAA-mandated portable control tower and the technical staff to support it would be added to the bill. As a result, the non-towered Casa Grande Municipal Airport will remain an uncontrolled field during the fly-in. While Copper State's usual notice to airmen will disappear along with the tower, much of the fly-in information previously provided by the NOTAM can now be found in a notice to pilots published on the Copper State website. The fly-in will be held October 24th to the 26th. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. The FAA plans to supersede an existing AD that applies to certain Piper aircraft models, AD 712108, Amendment 391312, currently requires replacement of the fuel selector valve cover. Since issuing the AD 712108, the FAA has learned of similar fuel selector valve issues existing in additional serial numbered airplanes that were not identified in the existing AD. A safety event in 2011 caused the loss of a model PA-28-180C airplane and a serious injury to one occupant. A subsequent FAA investigation revealed eight additional PA-28 series events dating from 1999 to the present that were the result of a similar fuel selector valve assembly issue. The resulting proposed and expand AD is estimated to affect 6,929 airplanes of U.S. registry. The estimated cost of repair is $42.50 
to have the airplanes inspected, and about $650 per airplane, including labor, to purchase the appropriate kit from Piper and have it installed. Piper has indicated the majority of the airplanes added to the applicability of this NPRM have likely already complied with the proposed action. The proposed AD is open for comments until October 4th. Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser spacecraft successfully completed a second captive carry test last Thursday, August 22nd at the agency's Dryden Flight Research Center in Edwards, California. During the two-hour test, Dream Chaser's flight computer, along with its guidance, navigation, and control systems were tested. The landing gear and nose skid also were deployed during flight. The vehicle was carried by an Ericsson Air Crane helicopter over a distance of 3 miles at an altitude of 12,400 feet. The test followed the projected path it will fly during future approach and landing tests at Dryden. SNC is working with NASA to develop Dream Chaser through the agency's Commercial Crew Development Round 2 and Commercial Crew Integrated Capability Initiatives. The test paves the way for upcoming free flight tests at Dryden this fall as part of the company's agreements with NASA. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. C. Gordon Fullerton, who compiled a distinguished career as a NASA astronaut, research pilot, and Air Force test pilot spanning almost 50 years, died August 21st. He was 76 years old. Fullerton had sustained a severe stroke in late 2009 and had been confined to a long-term care facility in Lancaster, California for most of the past three and a half years. Fullerton logged 382 hours in spaceflight on two space shuttle missions while in the NASA Astronaut Corps from 1969 to 1986. He then transferred to NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base where he served for 22 years as a research test pilot. Fullerton flew into space on the Space Shuttle Columbia during the eight-day STS-3 orbital flight test mission in March of 1982. That mission became the only shuttle mission to land at White Sands, New Mexico, because Rogers Dry Lake at Edwards was flooded by heavy seasonal rains. He then commanded the shuttle Challenger on the STS-51F Space Lab 2 mission in 1985. A celebration of Fullerton's life was held at NASA Dryden on Monday, August 26th. NASA is going back to the moon in an unmanned mission. NASA is making final preparations to launch a probe at 11.27 p.m. Eastern Time, Friday, September 6th from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on Wallops Island, Virginia. The small car-sized Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer is a robotic mission that will orbit the moon to gather detailed information about the structure and composition of the thin lunar atmosphere and determine whether dust is being lofted into the lunar sky. A thorough understanding of these characteristics of our nearest celestial neighbor will help researchers understand other bodies in the solar system, such as large asteroids, Mercury, and the moons of outer planets. 
The mission has many firsts, including the first flight of the Minotaur 5 rocket, testing of a high data rate laser communication system, and the first launch beyond Earth's orbit from the agency's Virginia Space Coast launch facility. The Pentagon has reduced its estimated cost for operation of the F-35-2 Lightning airplanes to under $1 trillion over its 55 years expected service life. The new estimate to operate and maintain the expected fleet of more than 2,000 airplanes is $857 billion, according to a report from Reuters. The new figures could make the airplane more attractive to international customers, officials said. The estimate is based on over 7,000 test flights. The Marine Corps also plans to do nearly all of the maintenance work on the F-35B in-house, a cost-saving measure. The JSF remains the most expensive weapon system ever developed by the U.S. military. Each week, we share with you a sample of an online video one of our viewers found especially entertaining. We call it our Aero Video of the Week. This week's ABW is short and sweet, and it shows something you won't see every day. A DC-6 landing on a private dirt strip. A word of caution, don't watch this if you're allergic to dust. Simply search YouTube for DC-6 landing and enjoy. The last of the original Blue Angels, Commander Al Taddeo, passed away August 19th at the age of 94. According to the Blue Angels Facebook page, Taddeo was the last surviving member of the first Blue Angel Squadron. He flew the F-6F Hellcat on the team from 1946 to 1947. This World War II hero shot down three Japanese airplanes while aboard the USS Enterprise. He was twice awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and retired as a commander in 1963. He was often sought out by those wanting to know the unit's early history. A nonprofit group in Gulfport, Mississippi, known as the Brown Condor Association, is working to raise some $7 million and hopes to be able to save an historic structure at Gulfport Biloxi International Airport. The structure is thought to be one of the last remaining World War II aircraft hangars in the country. The association told airport commissioners that the goal is to establish a museum to honor the state's aviation and aerospace accomplishments. The hangar was damaged by Hurricane Katrina, and the airport authority received $3.2 million from FEMA for repairs. But FEMA said the airport authority could not use the money it received to mothball the building until it could be repaired. The airport commission places the total cost of the rehabilitation of the building at 10 to $11 million, according to a report in the Sun-Herald newspaper. The hangar is continuing to deteriorate as time goes by, and the clock is ticking. If the money is not spent by the end of 2014, FEMA wants it back. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please join us again this Friday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.